Hello, welcome to Epic FM. The UK is what we're going with this week. The UK's number one Mark <laughs> Four podcast. Oh, number one Mark Four well podcast. Done, yeah, it's a good show. The number one. You're listening to Epic FM. The number one Mark Four podcast. Does this mean could, technically this is the first ever Mark Four podcast? Like it could ever. be breaking new ground. Breaking new ground. So we're the best, the only, the supreme <laughs> Mark Four podcast. <laughs> My name is Paul, aka Northy. Today I'm joined by Brett, the Hitman Wilkie, and Jamie, the what shall I reveal you as this week? The Russian. Let's stick with the Russian. Jamie, the Russian, Cook Rogers. Thank you. Fortunately, I've been my English accent, so I wouldn't give it away. <laughs> yeah. You do such a good fake British accent. Accent. It's pretty. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Thanks for joining us, Jamie. Good to see you, mate. Oh, thank you for having me on. How have you been keeping? Yeah, good man. Good. How about yourselves? Yeah, we're all right, aren't we, Brett? Well, how are you doing, Brett? I think you're all right, I'm assuming. Yeah, I think I'm all right. I think I'm all right. We picked a really uh... quiet day to do this, didn't we? <laughs> In no way whatsoever. We did plan it a little Absolutely. bit. It's been absolutely stacked. It's all right. I, I read all the updates while I'm just <laughs> doing bedtime for my son, so it's fine. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm fully up to speed, definitely, definitely. Everyone appreciates the commitment, Brett. We know you're juggling. We know we're juggling, and, and we appreciate that. So, if this is people's first time listening to the show, it might be because we're talking about Mark Four, which is going to be of a lot of interest to people. Do please like and subscribe. Check out the channel on YouTube. We're doing a bunch of videos. We're making weekly content on Mark Three, and I imagine now Mark Four. So, do keep your eye out. <laughs> what we're going to do? We're going to get straight into it because this could be a subject that you know there's a, there's a lot to break through. So, we're going to get straight into it, and. We're going to talk about the announcement that came out today from Privateer Press. So we didn't discuss it loads last time on the podcast, um, I don't think. But we were talking about it in our groups, weren't we? Kind of like what we thought they might discuss and they might talk about and what was going to happen. Just as like an initial starting point, were you guys surprised at this? Did it catch you off guard or was it, okay, yeah, no, saw that coming? I think... I think in our groups, we'd got a number of people that were almost putting together like troll orientated wish lists of just like, I'm just going to throw this out there to be controversial. It's never going to happen. And then, you know, someone would like try and one ups it, like top trumps it. I'll throw this out there. It's never going to happen. I'll throw this out there. It's never going to happen. And then they've all sat there and they've basically been eating their own words today, haven't they? Because yeah. they've gone 3D printing, Mark IV. Uh, legacy models, so so of all the things that we were speculating, and sort of you know doing us a bit of a piss take, it turns out <laughs> it turns out they were thinking about. Yeah, they've gone they've gone all in. What about you, Jamie? Did it catch you off guard, mate? There's been lots of speculation, like I said. We've had um, you know people who are changing productions, people saying about Mark IV, people saying about uh, like a whole variety of different stuff, and I think the generic answer has been. Yes, pretty much everything that everybody suggested has happened. And I think that's probably the one thing that surprised us all. I don't think anyone was quite prepared for just how sweeping and broad these uh, these changes are going to be to the game. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to take in, isn't there? I think I think I said in the group, I, I read it and I was like, there's too much to, like, there's too, there's too much to process. I'm capped out. I thought this was <laughs> going to be like a quick and easy, like, oh, 3D printing, that's pretty cool. Interesting. Instead, it's like, oh, my God, there's like an absolute overload of information. Well, well they've, they've basically they've written a thesis, haven't they, to explain all their yeah, decision yeah. making as well. Yeah. I mean, that's it turns out they've been quiet for six months because they've been writing that document, I think, let alone yeah. the rules changes or anything else or the development going in the background. You know, yeah, just no constructing doubt. that 40,000 word thesis has taken them some time. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. Blood Bowl 69's put small spoilers here and then a YouTube link. I'm not even going to click it because that's blatantly Rick Astley. <laughs> like I bet, I bet, I bet money that is Rick Astley. I wonder if I can hover over it and give a clue. But none uh, of that. Just, none of that. The suspense is killing me. <laughs> All right. So just, I just thought like a few general ground rules before we get into it, because obviously people are going to be talking about it in the Twitch chat and people are going to be talking about. It on is this for us or? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, probably for all three of us. No, I think I think I think we'll be fine. What's Matt saying? He's Brett using that background in hope he can still use that model. Yeah, I don't think we're wrong. That's his favourite. That's his favourite. No, PP can't it take could, that away from him. It you could be the last time we see it in Mark Three. No. <laughs> I'm right. just going to have legacy backgrounds from now until the release of Mark <laughs> Four. Brett, the legacy Wilkie. 
just, mm. right. just <laughs> mo models I've painted and that I wish I could play still. <laughs> <laughs> right, here, here are the ground rules I'm going to propose. First one, well, I think the first thing is this is probably a really stressful day for, I guess, PP staff and, and you know, from, from working in a space where you have to do big announcements, it is really stressful. Even if you think it's a good idea, you just, th there is a feel of dread. So I think we should be really positive. I think you guys are, you two are anyway. I think we should be kind of positive and inquisitive about the announcement and kind of al also recognize that our information is really limited. So we're actually going to do another show tomorrow, aren't we? When the rules are dropped, because that feels like a huge moment for me. That probably feels bigger than this. So we're going to look at the rules, but I guess we just recognize that information is quite limited at this stage so we'll we'll kind of stick our nose into this and have some like initial reflections but recognize that this is it will be a process of learning more about the changes and it would be um it it would be daft for us to make big assumptions or wide sweeping claims the facebook forms are already people kind of jamie you were talking about it with me before people are like so you're saying i can never use any model that i own ever and it's like no <laughs> Wait, I've, I've, I've seen the first person selling all their armies on on the uk facebook because they've seen the announcement today not even joking <laughs> people are so <laughs> are so interested out there um all right cool so with that said there could be a really nice sweet spot for for a buyer's market at the moment i reckon <laughs> if you buy it today before rules are released <laughs> <Yes>. tomorrow <laughs> It's a bargain. You've got to sell it back to them tomorrow when it turns out they can still use all their models. <laughs> yes, today's the day. Get out on Facebook, get fishing. All right, Matt Ford, what we're going to do is is we're going to, uh, we're just going to go through the announcement. We're not going to read it word for word, partly because my if anyone's heard me try to read stuff out loud, it's not pretty, but um, we'll kind of pull out the key things. It's it's super long. It's, it's super, super long. But the first part of it then is this why oh why. So there are three kind of key bullet points in this section of Matt Wilson spelling out the driving re reasons behind embarking on a new edition. And, and the three main points that he makes really that new editions are controversial but necessary and then kind of alludes to that like, you know, there are only two things wargamers hate, the way things are and change. Which I think is a fair, I mean, fair enough. <laughs> I, think that, I think that's kind of true. Yeah, right? like, I will just make a little observation there. I... In terms of the game, the general consensus is that the game is currently in a really good position, though. Well, this is so, where, this is where the tension sits, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so, so you know, I, I fully appreciate the sentiment of that statement from Matt Wilson, and and you know, I, I think it applies to a whole range of walks of life. But there's not many people that you speak to at the moment that are dissatisfied with the game. I know there's things around the game. And things around what actually goes on the table when we're rolling dice. But in terms of the game product, I think people are, are pretty satisfied with that. And so, you know, it, it it does feel like there's an element of risk associated with, you know, are, are they are they changing for change's sake the game, the game mechanic, etc. Um, here's, the, here's the thing though brett the chats there's all sorts going on in the chat that i want to read out but i'll, I'll come back to it. the the i feel like the state of the game is amazing it's really good like we've been talking loads since we started doing the podcast again that like oh it's so like it is in such a good position it's so much fun but we're coming from an angle of like we know loads about the game we know all the casters so that like yeah, yeah, model thing is just like instinctual because we've seen those models release yeah i remember i remember chromat coming out i remember buying <laughs> the chromat. Do you know I mean, I remember being at the club in York with you two, being like, "Let's look at these chromat rules." But to a new player, that's just like, Ugh, "Like, what the hell?" I've got to absorb like two hundred things. And I think what we talked about in the cast, the the one the episode we did is PP's lack of focus causing causing fury. I don't think I really realised until absorbing some of this stuff that PP is probably in not a great state as a company. So the rules are great. The rules are brilliant for us, but like, I think that you know. Every single war game shop I've been in recently to play an event doesn't have any privateer press stock. It's just not there. It's just there's just, yeah, it's, yeah, just yeah. it's just not on the shelves. And I think I think they get into that. It's uh, I'll cross the bridge first. Then they very obviously we're going to have to talk about um, GW here. Um, it's pretty much openly compared to in the article. Um, and <laughs> I, it's interesting. Living games have a shelf life. Let's compare it to the giants in the room. Forty k, for example. 
Um, they have more factions and a much wider model range, much deeper as well in many senses um, and than War Machine has in some senses. When was the last time anyone saw a first-born Space Marine, a non-primary Space Marine release? Um, that's been quite some time. There's a lot of older models that haven't seen um, updates for years and years. And it's really interesting to decide that living games have a shelf life. At first, I was thinking, well, no, you can you, games have shown you can cast on for 25, 30 years, fine. But actually, unofficially, they do relegate out old models. They do let the old skews die off. And that living game, there must also be a circle of life, a dive at the end of life comes the death and the rebirth and through. So maybe there's some kind of big like Lion King X, like, like, I don't know, metaphor in all this. Uh, but I thought that was a really yeah. interesting observation about wargaming generally. Are we, when, are we about to cue in Elton John with a... No, well, like... I was just going to say, when you were undercover in Russia, <laughs> is, was it sort of a preacher that you were going for? Because that was quite good. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I nearly got on my feet then, Jamie. That was... <laughs> hey, Matt. Small. Yeah, you're right. No, I think you, you, I think you, I think you make a good... Uh... You make a good point. They do, they do have a shelf life. And Brett, I, I think we touched on the first like major reason as to why this announcement is happening. Game feels great for us because we've been playing it. You know, we, we, yeah, yeah, we, get, yeah. we The bloat to us isn't stressful, but we have alluded in the podcast a few times to like, we were even talking the other day about doing a video that was like, do you like War Machine? Here's how you get stock. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> if you're in the UK and you like War Machine, here's like a detailed video on how you can get models, which is wild. Like that's that's wild that you even have to do that. Like, can you imagine any other miniature company, right? Like, you know, they're just like, well, yeah, just walk into a shop and, and you'll see it. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. I had, um, I, I had a, we had a, a new guy at the club, um, at our gaming club on Monday. We had eight people playing. Um, so, four tables, all people playing, loads of different things. You know, we've got 120 mil bases, solos, units. Like, there was the full thing to look at. Uh, and he, the chat was just having a chat to me. Uh, but I was I was playing a secret masters list, and so you know the board was just you know every model on my side of the table was unique. You know there was a thrall, there was a river raider, you know there's a primal archon, there's there's three different types of warp wolf, um, you know, and and I ended up sort of trying to explain that the models have an archetype. You know, because you're saying, oh, there must be so many rules. I'm like, well, there is, but you know, all the all the wolves have, you know, defense 14. There are, you know, so like, like you start describing an archetype, don't you? And again, I think that for us, that's that's second nature now, isn't it? We we can look at yeah, a model, for sure. you know, and it, you know, a scantily clad farm lady running around, gonna have stealth, gonna be armor 11. You know, we we don't need to know the rule. To understand probably what some of the uh, range of the stats are going to be but when you look at the board and how many different types of models there are on the board like you can fully understand yeah. no definitely where where a new person that's quite a daunting prospect yeah yeah but then i mean but how would we feel i mean you've done this paul how did you feel jumping into 40k because i because i walk past Broke. a 40k table and i probably feel the same i haven't got a clue what's going on yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, yeah, you definitely were like, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. And same when I played AOS, it was just like, you're just going to have to. But the, but, then the, but then the weird thing about those games is they're not as punishing. So I think the other war games, strategy games, you need, you need to know what your stuff does and like what your opponent's stuff does. It is really useful and the better players obviously know what it does. But in War Machine, it's just so brutal if you don't know what your opponent's stuff does. You literally just lose the game. Whereas in AOS, you're like, oh, for next turn, I'm going to do that differently, and you're still in the game. Yeah. yeah. So it's the it's just the brutality of War Machine, I think, where the tension's always sat with that. The well, I remember... I'm trying um, to read out this chat, so go on. Phil, Phil always used to say that one of the things he liked when he transitioned to AOS, but was play, just playing less games, Yeah. was he, he knew his stuff just hit on a four-up. Yeah. You know, and it just damaged on a five up you know the you know all the all the other interactions around pow armor etc etc he didn't need to know any of that to to still be engaged in the game and so once he was playing at a more casual level that became more appealing yeah no, so there's that. yeah there's a whole variety of i guess highly yeah. impactful factors that come into accessibility of a game yeah uh, time commitment but, to uh, accessibility it. accessibility versus depth that's the thing that is all i've always really enjoyed about war machine is it's not that accessible 
but once you appreciate the depth of it, then you make some compromises when it comes to accessibility. You know, it's, a, it's you're like, wow, it's like super deep. Glitchy bit just said, I think the game is in a great state, and if the intent was to never release another, mo if the intent was to never release a model again, but you need constant new models to keep people in stores and interested. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. And I think that's a challenge. So I think that's what they're saying in the first bit. The second bit, then, how to blow up the world without hurting anyone. <laughs> Fine. Subtle Understand references. Yeah, understanding the reasons behind the difficult choices we've made in the new edition. So the main points here were that the existing catalogue of miniatures for War Machine and Hordes is overwhelming for players, retailers, distributors, and, con and continuing to expand upon that catalogue exacerbates the problems that result from it. I think we've touched on that there. Oh, Gav's in the chat. How's he, how's he on from custody? Has he got his phone inside? Well, he's... It's very easy to sneak things in if you know where to put them, Paul. That's wild. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That should go without saying for anybody. Some of his some of his buttons might be a bit sticky. That's all I'm saying. Whoa, whoa, kid show. <laughs> it's, it's a poor one, but I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. And hi, guys. <laughs> well, hi, everyone in the chat. Uh, in order to maintain the playability of the entire catalogue of existing models, we've created two arenas of play. Unlimited, which will allow all existing and new Mark IV models to be playable, and Prime, which will provide limited model options in building armies from the pre-existing catalogue, as well as incorporate all new Mark IV releases. This feels like a very, very significant bullet point in the document. Jamie, you were kind of taking me through this a little bit before, because you've got quite a good grasp on it. So what's your kind of understanding of that position? So... Um... The first thing to get across here is, contrary to what half of the general Discord page is at the moment, this is not saying that nobody you can't play with your army, you can't play with your factions. So, further on down, you see that every army is going to get, or every every faction, I'll use the terminology correctly, every faction is going to receive two armies. And armies roughly translate through to uh, theme forces. We see it now. Uh, there's an example further on down the article which shows the I'll Signal ones. That, yeah. You've got the Storm Legion and the Grave Diggers. Yeah, um, which are both under the Signar faction. The same way that Mark III has been played for many years now, where you play in a theme force which is um, thematically linked to a certain aspect of your faction. Um, things look and are designed to synergize together. It took off really well with the early CIDs, Storm of the North, um, Grave Diggers, Primal Terrors, etc. Um, and I think that's I think that's a, a it's done well for the game to sort of block and break down this huge catalog. The models into more digestible chunks where i'm just going to play i'm just going to play primal terrors and learn how all this stuff works i don't have to worry about all the rest of the faction just little bits um it's also uh the the downside of that is and again we're going to have to keep relating to what happened to warhammer fantasy and to age of sigma um all of the models that we currently own because no one owns any mark for models yet um are unknown as to what they're going to be playable. We don't know what theme force is going to be released first or what yeah. army is going to be released first. So there might be some models that don't get Mark IV rules yet. And we don't know what their lifespan is. Um, you, Paul, you played AOS for a while. When was the last time you saw a Warhammer Fantasy model on the table from before the transition to AOS? Oh, yeah, like super rare, like if any. Yeah. Maybe some proxies, but... Now that, now, that has taken many, many years to reach that point, but... If we were to forecast, you know, five to ten years ahead, I would not be surprised if we see that most of the the legacy models that we currently own are not seen on the table unless they are converted or um, refreshed in some other way we haven't been yet told about. On the current trajectory, I would not be surprised to see that transition yeah. over. And I think as long-term collectors, you know, we own I think eight factions between us now. Um, we probably have to come to terms with that. That's a bit where the tension sits, and I only I made the point at the beginning that like let's be positive, inquisitive. And recognise that the information's limited, and we're not going to we're not going to doom by any means because we're really positive about the game, we really enjoy the game, and it's brought us. Up, that's why we're all mates. Do you know what I mean? It's an integral part of our friendships. But like, that is the bit where I'm a little bit like, oh man, I've spent so much money, I have so many models that I really enjoy playing. I really like the aesthetic of them. I've made some lists that I really enjoy the synergy of, and the idea that there's just going to be a bit of a line in the sand around, oh, you know, going to they're going to fade out if if the if the content if if the models and the rules were released at a speed by which that felt like a transition i think that might 
not be too much of a terrible experience. You know what I mean? Like, here's Legion, and it yeah. still does this, this, and this. And, you know, I know you add this list, but that list is slightly different now than these models. Okay, cool. Play style kind of moves over, get the stuff. But it's that the bit where I think there's a little bit of tension is the kind of like limited release type. You know, we've got four armies at the moment. And, and the, na the competitive way in which we play in the game. Right now, there's these 200 models, and that is a massive blow, and that is really stressful for new players. But it's also made this really cool, diverse meta where there's loads. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Where there are loads of right now, there are loads of different approaches and styles and and lists, and and the, losing that does yeah does cause a little yeah. bit of concern. Brett, well, and I, I think don't don't overlook the anxiety as well. So I know you've talked just about collections, but the hobby side of things. You know, people people will have spent a lot of time painting, converting, you know, their faction that they've been collecting. You know, I mean, Gav's been playing since Mark 1. You know, I started right at the beginning of Mark 2. You know, we've, you know, these models have been part of our, you know, our lives and our hobby for, for 12 years, 12, you know, more than 12 years. You know, and, you know, those models we've, you know, I've, I've spent hours and hours painting some of those things. You, you commissioned a, a life-size uh, mosaic portrait of Chromac 2 to hang on the wall behind you as well. Yeah, it's not even a green screen. That's just the man's wall. That's like what you get to paint. It's the end of the um, game. So, so there's naturally going to be that bit of anxiety in and around that, isn't there, in terms of, you know, there's there's been a significant investment from a lot of us into all the different parts of the hobby, like you say, list building, you know, yeah. aligning styles to factions, uh, painting, hobbying, converting. Yeah. That, that naturally we're now going, oh, oh, what does this mean? What does this mean for me and my models? Yeah. And I, and I think that's, it's a very human reaction, that, isn't it? I, you yeah, can't get money. You spent money. You spent money and enjoyed yeah, the yeah. game. I think that, I, I guess the bit that we're obviously like, we would draw a line in is being like Doom and being on Facebook. Like, let's go with the facts that we know. But I think if, if, they're obviously the rules are going to come out tomorrow, which is going to be really, really, really pivotal. But I guess in the coming months, that's something that I will want to see more discussion and dialogue from PP. Like, you know, I totally appreciate the position that they've got. They need to make money. They're a company, you know, like I completely understand those concerns and those stresses. And like, ultimately, we live in a world where if your company can't function and turn a profit, then they're in a game. And I'm supportive of that as a, as a position, 100%. But at the same time, it would be, good to have a bit more of a discussion and insight into the players that do have big collections and have a lot of models and we'll still put you know if pp release some more models i'll put money in i'm not like i'm tapped out on pp you know create products now I'll, I'll buy stuff i mean i'll buy things but it would be good to have a better idea of how those models might fit into that pending edition there's a comment underneath that says new mechanics created for mark 4 such as warjack customization are not backward compatible with existing models well there will be when i snap the fucking arms off and stick new ones on <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They might not be backwards compatible now, but I can snap an arm off and stick another arm on. Because <laughs> that's what they're referring to. There's a bit later on that talks about one of the new mechanics or one of the new things that they're looking at is this idea that, you know, we'll come on to the 3D printing, but you can kind of change the arms, magnetize the arms, and stick different mm. arms on for some like instant customization. The way I read that, because there's a comment in there which we'll come to, which talks about some of the thoughts that had around second turns and kind of you know like oh you're going second maybe you could change your war jacks uh, you know maybe you could be like okay cool i'm going second but i'm going to re-kick this war jack so, so something like that you're kind of alluding to that so maybe what they mean there is literally those models that you've got that are like glued in and pinned they're not compatible because you ain't gonna be able to change their arms yeah yeah, yeah. you ain't gonna be able to do that but it might be that you could still use it um you, you know it would still be valid in the edition there's a bit so of chat Go on. I mean, I think you, your average hobbyist has probably been magnetizing their jackets for a period of time already. You just got out there, Brett, but you're back. Oh, yeah. sorry. I was just saying, no, um, I, I, I think your average hobbyist has probably been magnetizing their jackets for for a period of time already. Yeah. You know, I, you <laughs> know I've, I've got Signar jacks that are ironclads and defenders, you know. Uh, the the Toro for Crucible Guard is really easy to magnetize in terms of making it into the other into the other loadouts. Yeah. Um. So I I I think that's been happening for a period already. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. Um. And again, we'll 
we'll get onto this probably a bit later on with other aspects, but this is the first part I looked at and thought that is Warcaster. So I know you guys haven't seen or Tell played. Tell me a bit Warcaster. about this Warcaster because Matt, Matt, and thanks yeah, for keep know. chatting. I'm glad there's a lot of chat going on. I will pull out the bits that are coming through. And hi yeah, to Matt, yeah. I've seen in the chat. But like, what, what is what, what is war, what's Warcaster? So War- Warcaster Neo Mechanica is um, the war game that Privateer Press released about two years ago now via Kickstarter. Um, it was sort of an offshoot. If Riot Quest was the grim darkness or the the post apocalypse of War Machine, Neo Mechanica may or may not have been. War- what happened when for all those who escaped the infernal invasion? Um, I don't know what, some any, of of that, I don't know what any of that bit meant there because that was fluff. But yeah, just, <laughs> that was the law. Everyone likes the game law. So it's basically 40k, Paul. Right. How did that do? Nish. It, it, so the idea is there's still a war caster, but it's not a model on the board. It's you. You have a deck of cards and you have focus yourself and you allocate it to do things on the board. And you have an army, which is skirmish level. You have warjacks, which are small, medium base. You've got two or three man units. And right. there's no such thing as attrition. You summon down these sort of space gates and you deploy things onto the battlefield. If someone think gets destroyed, it goes back into your pool. But you have to spend your focus to bring it back. So it's a really interesting sort of n- unique war game style where attrition doesn't okay. really exist. So um, what's the, the reference bring- for that in, in this then? What's the link? The warjacks were fully mag- adaptable, so every faction uh, got one right. warjack. But all they they ba- instead of saying, "Oh, you know, this could either get a defender or an ironclad or a hammersmith," um, I got the chassis wrong there. This is a um, this is a defender warjack. There are eight different guns and four different heads, all of which have their own abilities, weapons, or special rules. You can combine them in any way you want. And it sees further on down. They talk about I think it's in the Orgoth one. The jacks they have each have four heads, which have a different cortex rule. And eight different weapons which you pick any two of yeah, so it's not just so it's not just you get to magnetize it, it is you actually get to build a warjack um in uh it's not just a one of three ways it's one of um you know a dozen or two different ways depending on what utility does that impact the point value jamie or is it a flat rate point for the for the the base chassis i mean i guess it must have if you put a gun on it or a reach weapon it must change the point value in Warcaster, it didn't affect it, okay. um, uh, but the, but the point scale is it was because you summon them by paying focus. It would be one focus for a unit, one focus for a light jack. A heavy jack would be two focus. Um, so it was so less it, relevant because you didn't start with a yeah. Because attrition wasn't a part of the game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I I think they will bring in points personally for this for that for that kind of reason. I've just got um, visions but, now yeah. of of building AOS lists. Well. Uh, what I'm a fantasy list where you used to give units shields for an extra point per man and yeah. then you give them like a great weapon for an extra two points and you you know so like there was a core unit wasn't there but then you keep just adding you know put a standard bearer in it put a champion in it yeah. put yeah um, yeah okay so there could be some sort of shared thinking there between Warcaster the the final bullet point is it will take at least until the end of 2023 before we can release Mark IV rules conversions for all existing models. So let me just get this bit like really clear in my head then. So all the Legion models that I own, by the end of 2023, there will be a Mark IV rule for that model, right? But Hmm. will that model be usable in Prime, which I'm assuming is the most supported, balanced, competitive part of the game that's the bit i wasn't sure about because they, it clearly says that we're gonna all there's gonna be in order to maintain the playability of the entire catalog of existing models we've created two arenas of play unlimited which will allow all existing and new mark four models to be played and prime which will provide limited model options in building armies from the pre-existing catalog as well as the as well as incorporate all new rules for mark four I, I think so, unlimited you'll be able to play your full faction as is basically um with no and then limits the... on the army composition like just leave so yeah you'll just be able to do whatever you want and then the prime version you might only be able to take you know your winged war beast as opposed to your you know your carnivian chassis or whatever it is they'll that's where they'll either rotate in and out models or they'll retire legacy models from that format is that and, how you read it uh, that was my impression yeah, and I, th- I I agree there. I think you nailed it exactly, Brett. And I think the extra bit there is what they're implying is for Prime. Prime only uses armies. You can't have a, a themeless, if you like, um, army there. 
And when it says limited bottle options and building armies from the pre-existing catalog, i.e. legacy stuff, yeah. as well as incorporating all the releases, what I interpret for that personally is that not every model we currently own is going to fit into a into an army, into a, a, a theme, the new theme forces. A prime um, army. Yeah, yeah, a prime yeah, a prime army. Uh, so you might find, well, we'll find that probably some of our collection is only available in legs in in the unlimited formats yeah. because it doesn't belong to an army. Um, but prime will probably be a mixture of legacy models that are reworked, tooled up, and focused into a theme force like exemplars, banes, etc. That we'll see tomorrow, or um, the new stuff that's come on out. And I think the, the so does that make sense? It's kind of like a mixture of you can play theme sections of your armies you've already got in prime formats that's my interpretation of it but i okay. could well be wrong we i might think be if you look at the if you look at the signar example they give they give you a, a new army don't you there's the storm legion hmm. and then they they give what we're already familiar with don't they in terms of the the grave digger stroke trencher army <laughs> which is basically a you know a legacy theme force um that you can play in the new format of prime now yeah. it, it did occur to me that the war machine factions as they are currently they probably have much clearer archetype unit options i think than the hordes factions do you know when you think about signar they've got you know gun majors trenchers storm dudes haven't they hmm. um you know and, and you, you can go through the other factions and do similar can't you in terms of like they've got winter guard um, you know, they've got the big man of war boys, you know, they've got very obvious differentiated units. And I, I think a lot of the Horde factions, they're less obvious as to what their, you know, their three archetypal units are, as it were. So whether there'll be some challenge in, in plucking them out in terms of the thematic orientation or not, who knows? Yeah. Or whether you'll just take, you know, you'll have a wider selection of options available to you a couple of comments from the chat just to jump in because there's loads of good chat going on demand will be the de this is andy demand will be the decider whether events are unlimited or prime if pp wants to push events to prime they will have to throw a bunch of price support at tos to run prime masters events i think that's a fair reflection but this paragraph here is interesting so the blog says the unlimited arena is going to feel a bit like the wild west where everything goes and there are a few restrictions this might sound great if you're an existing player. Our exception is it's not going to be a place that new or returning players jump into, nor do we expect that everyone will necessarily aspire to do so. We will hold unlimited arena events in the future and support this mode of play. It, this is a bit that I think is interesting. It won't be the competitive, competitive arena because, as we've established, the back catalogue of models is unmanageably large and every new addition makes it less viable to balance for competitive play. So my thinking is that Unlimited is just going to be a bit like, from a balanced perspective, they're like, you know, it's not on the mind. Like, it's just a bit, you know, it's a bit wild and it's more like the, the, the pool, rather than it being sort of the players who we like the full experience, we like to play quite, you know, complex instead it being mates who are like oh you know should we get that archangel out we have you know should i just play a game with the archangel for a laugh can you remember what that was like that kind of thing which is why that's a particular area of interest for me because I, I it sounds as though the prime bit will naturally be the more balanced competitive rule set and thereby personally interest me more to play i mean the ti the timeline yeah, and just going back to the timeline, that wouldn't be until the end of twenty twenty three anyway, when they've got in a position where all the models are all the models are yeah. out there. There's a general theme, just as like a general reflection and comment at this point. There is a general theme, isn't there, of like the focus is definitely on getting a system that players can walk into a shop and pick up and creating a game set and a rule set and mechanics that kind of are simplified and are of a much smaller pool. Hmm. And uh, and again, we can talk about this in coming casts and stuff, and maybe we can reflect on it and talk about it again tomorrow, but that I wonder what that looks like as a competitive game in terms of the scope and depth of the strategy that's applied. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. You know, we've got four factions that are sort of like... You can immediately see how that might make quite a limited meta. 
versus snow. Yeah, there are. I mean, there are two hundred. There are loads of bottles. <laughs> yeah. It's really, it is really complicated. But like, so is Magic the Gathering in modern, and it's a, in, it's a great. You know, I won't go about Magic, but it's in modern's in a great place in Magic because it's, lo- it's there's loads of cards. There's tons of cards. It's really diverse, and I think War Machines certainly my experience of coming back to the game has hit that point where the diversity is complicated and, and stressful, but it is also that diversity also creates an element of balance from a competitive. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I the, the variety we're seeing at the moment is, is really rewarding as a gaming experience. Mm. You know, like, for sure. you know, I, I love eating steak for tea and, you know, and that's that's brilliant, but I'm not sure I could just eat steak every night. You know, you, you need sure variety, don't you? But... <laughs> yeah, I could. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason you appreciate the steak is because some sometimes you just have a beef burger, don't yeah. you? Or you have something else. And um but I don't know whether you get into a point where you know, do you narrow it too much? So yeah, the quality's good, mm. but then you know, what's the longevity of that if there's not the same degree of variety? Yeah. And again, that's going to be one of those things that I think probably needs really carefully balancing. Yeah, and something that we won't make decisions on until we've read. You know, we're just yeah, expressing yeah. our kind of like early feedback. The other thing that'd be good to to break down at this point is in this same section. I'll just read the paragraph. We're also introducing command cards in Mark IV. When building an army in Mark IV, you'll also select a hand of five cards that possess one-shot abilities. While some of these cards are universally accessible and usable by any army, others are specific to certain Mark IV armies. Legacy armies, however... So what do they mean there by legacy armies? They mean legion, hordes... What do they mean? Yeah, the, they just mean everything that currently exists. Well, that everything mean, that's not got a Mark IV release currently. Right, okay. They, they mean... they. I think they refer to the the theme... The, the legacy armies refer to the armies, I, you know, the theme forces that come of the current models and current edition. So the carryover stuff that we given immediate mark for rules okay. um, built into a, a usable force um, here that can play alongside the new four factions, the new four things that have been announced on the same level. Um, I think okay. the limitation there is there is the, there's going to be this general use command card pool, but the new stuff, the new army boxes that get released, these the, the Storm Legion stuff, kind of the Orgoth stuff, will have additional command cards that only they can use. I, so that's my reason. Out, off the bat, they might be a bit uh, a bit punchier in terms of the options they've got. It's be like having wider options. Potentially. Or more specific to the army. Yeah. Legacy armies, however, will only have access to the general use command cards that are available to the faction. Maintaining the open anything goes environment for the unlimited arena means that legacy armies are not tailored the way new Mark IV armies will be designed, so army specific command cards aren't appropriate there. What do we think to that? That feels like the Grimkin mechanic. <laughs> yeah. Right? Feels like an arcana. Yeah, we I'll spoke this one. about that a little bit earlier, didn't we? Just a, a little micro feat that you can, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, we don't know what they are, but, you know, you could see it being. A little speed buff or a little strength buff or, yeah. you know, some also sort of defense. pass a tough check or something like that. Play. But I, Interesting. But I, Any strong reactions to that? In, well, I mean, I've always really liked the Grimkin mm. interaction from that perspective. I, I didn't like it for the first two or three months. <laughs> <laughs> <You're only laughs> like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, but once you've got your head around it, I actually think it's a really nice dynamic interaction. And there's there's not often in a game of War Machine where if you're if it's not your turn, you don't do a lot, do you? Other than mark damage. Yeah, it's quite passive. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, quite yeah. passive. So it, it does make That's the turn a little bit more interactive potentially if there's that opportunity to to play those cards outside of your actual turn and things. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't mind the sound of that. I think even if that's hoping that there's interactive ones, ones that you can play to counter your opponent's turn as well, which I hopefully there will be some of, I think most of them are going to fall into active uses. And yeah, actually, does. I think that's quite interesting. You know, if you've got, um, uh, I keep talking about other war games and the war machine, not going to have you back, but Malifaux does this quite well. You have, you instead of rolling a dice, you have a deck of cards and you yeah. flip and that score is your outcome. But you have a hand of cards as well. So you know, if you need something to happen, this card in my hand means I get to really make sure this thing happens. If you've got a card that says um, this model gets, um, you know, plus two, you know, or boost a charge tax, something like that, and you really need that charge tax to go off, you can play that card and guarantee that goes yeah. off. I think it probably gives 
more strategic if it plays out that kind of way it probably gives more options and more tactical depth to the game um but hope hopefully not in an overly complicated way it's also interesting whether it's open play or close play will you know what cards your opponent has to work out around them or is it going to be a aha you've activated my trap card um <laughs> Gav's just saying, think, Gav, Gav's anything, just read about the 3D uh, models, bless. <laughs> anything that results in me rolling less dice, I'm happy with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay, so we've gone through that. Okay, wait, Gav, it's good for Matt. He just bought a bloody 3D printer, didn't he? He's going to be printing for days. Right, so the next section, factions and armies and... Oh, I'll just say this word, Jamie. You say it with such... Military uh, finesse, cadres, 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 cadres. Yeah, yeah. By well, the official pronunciation, it's yeah, cadres. Yeah. You and your military background—it's so useful on the show, isn't it? I, I mean, I can either confirm or deny this. No, nobody knows whether I'm in the military or not, anyway. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, you work at Tesco. <laughs> it's, all, it's, all, it's, all, it's all just a blag. You work at Tesco. <laughs> the new higher. It's fine. I, I don't know there's anything wrong with that. The new uh, hierarchy in factions and armies in the introduction of cadres, cadres, cadres. In Matt 4, <laughs> the force you put on the tabletop is an army, which is a subset of a faction. Models from armies within the same faction are not compatible. Cadres provide small subsets of a faction that are compatible with all armies without a faction. There is a graph, uh, there is a picture. You kind of talked through this earlier, Jamie. It's a bit theme forcey vibes, isn't it, basically? So there's kind of the built upon the theme force mechanic approach. Any major thoughts on that? Doesn't feel like the that doesn't feel like the biggest announcement. Well, I, I guess it is in some ways that you're still going to have the faction, right? You're just going to have the armies within the faction that you pick from. Yeah, I, I think this is just the next stage of evolution from from when they first introduced theme forces. So can you remember when they first introduced yeah. Theme Forces, Mark II, where every caster had their own unique Theme yeah. Force? I mean, that that was the Wild West. Yeah. Um, you know, and so the, the shift in Mark III to just having, you know, three or four Theme Forces that casters just play in was a, you know, was a strong move and, again, helped streamline the game and helped them just balance the Theme Forces as well in terms of... Hey, maybe that's why they did it, you know. From a game, I didn't really think this at the time, but maybe that's why they did the theme forces to try and just limit the model size a bit, crunch it down to be like, whoa, this game's way too complicated for people. Let's make theme forces that are clearly better than the other stuff, so people are massively incentivized to just streamline the list and just crunch yeah, it down. Yeah. But that hasn't worked, has it? Because they've rewritten the rules and then the diversity's gone super. But the, you know, current theme forces are in a, still in a much better position than they were Mark II. And this just, like I say, it just feels yeah. like the next level of evolution for what a, a theme force is. They're just calling it now an army, aren't they, as opposed yeah. to a theme force. Next section called Where's the Beef? <laughs> Here An we go. explanation of how hordes <laughs> will be incorporated into Mark IV. This is fairly big. Hordes will no longer be separate, be a separately... I can't speak. Hordes will no longer be a separately maintained brand. Hordes rules will be rolled into War Machine. The... Well, I'll read the other two. The first four armies of Mark IV will be Warcaster-led. I mean, that's a long time. Two all-new Warlock-led armies will launch in 2023. There is a timeline for that at the bottom, I think. Yeah, yeah. Of when that will actually I think, be. I mean, for, for full disclosure, all, all three of us, our primary faction, are all Horde's factions, aren't they? Yeah. So... Yeah, yeah, not ideal. You know, so so for us, this this definitely was some of the the news and the announcement that you know we're we've perhaps got greater anxiety over than some of the other things that were mentioned. I can't see where it is in the timeline. Can you, Jamie, where that kicks in? The hordes thing. It's yeah. right on the right hand side of that flow diagram. Uh, oh, yeah, August twenty twenty three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the yeah. That's so long away. That's like over I mean, a year away. I mean, let, we, we, we do need to caveat this. This yeah, is no additions to the two armies that will drop at the start of Mark IV. So every, Circle, Legion, Scorn, um, uh, Trolls, hopefully Minions, I hope, um, will all get two armies um, to play with using the legacy models. They just won't get anything okay. new until that point. So we're not... Right, we so, can me, so let's, let's clarify but, that, Jamie. So 
Legion will get two, basically, what I currently think of as themes. Yes. By my reading, and I'll see if I can find a quote for you whilst we're talking and about w- it. And what's the timeline on that? So that should be at Mark IV dropping. That's Mark IV um, release. So, okay, fine. So, oh, so off the bat, you'll still be able to play Legion against Storm Legion or... Um, you know the or the new ice ice Kado boys, uh, just using your legacy models, and they'll have, they'll have basically created two new theme forces armies for you to play Legion in. I think the the only other thing I read that they're not going to have rules are they for huge bases until much later in the cycle. Right, so as well. yeah, I, I sort of skipped past that, but there was something on that. So again, so, yeah. things like your Archangel, uh, your Throne of Everblight, that that's unlikely to see the table for a for a period yeah i'll just read i'll just read this bit then because it, it's important the biggest caveat with regards to the unlimited arena is that it will be a work in progress for some time when we created the third edition of war machine or blah 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 blah, blah it took us ages we knew going into mark for development that we couldn't go through that process again especially with the catalog now nearly 50 percent larger so with the mark four launch we will release rules for one legacy army oh, this is probably what you're looking for jamie yeah for no, one no. I stand corrected. There's only one, not two. Yeah. You've you've begun your lies, Jamie, already, and we're only forty six minutes in. <laughs> oh, yeah, away with it too. It wasn't for you, You're not yes. at work now. Yeah, propaganda, winning hearts and minds. It's information. <laughs> it's so with the Mark IV launch, we will release rules for one legacy army from each currently existing War Machine and Hordes faction. Okay. Well, so basically, I'll have one theme. So you can have one theme for us. How will you play a tournament with two lists with that then? Well, you've just taken the same theme for, surely. Two different casters. Yeah, yeah just different yeah. casters, same theme for. Yeah, okay. I, I, so one of my concerns there is that they've indicated, haven't they, elsewhere, that a, a new army is going to consist of three casters, two robots, uh, five units, and some, a bunch of solos. I, I guess the only concern is, is that if... If the new Legion army is only three casters, two beasts, five units, and a bunch of solos, because then that is extremely limiting. Dan just said, every month more legacy stuff comes out on the timeline. Let me get back to that, mate. Yeah, it does say, I was going to say, it says the line after that um, we will continue to develop them over time with the goal of completing the conversion to Mark IV for all legacy models by the end of 23. So at the day of release, we all get one army to play with. And then over the coming months, they'll release more and more as they continue developing them rather than trying to rush through them all and get them done in one go, which we, I think the Mark III transition lost a lot of people over because they had a huge amount of playtesting, balancing things to do with. And the feeling was generally came out of, bit disorganized and yeah. they'd bit more than they could chew uh okay I, re- there's some reassuring information there then so i think you might have said this brett in the chat and it, maybe it's just th- something we put a question mark over but not clear whether the hordes mechanical stay or whether it'll hold do they, do they mean hordes will just become war machine as a name i think they're just using? they're now the going to market it under under the name war, war machine, machine. But so there's, we're there's no from now on yet. we're just playing War Machine, the game War Machine, rather than Hordes and War Machine. Oh, it says we're keeping all the original flavour and mechanics of the Hordes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah, so that that was answered. That's answered there. Okay. So I guess we've come, yeah. I mean, I guess so Hordes, Hordes is basically becoming War Machine. Then there is. I've seen the chat. Then, then there's a War Room is Dead, Long Live War Room. Details about the all-new app that's been developed for Mark IV. None of this seemed particularly surprising. Everything's going to be free, but if you want to build lists, you have to subscribe, is the basic headline, right? War well, Room I thought it was fun- if you want to save lists, wasn't it? Yeah, if you want like more than two it lists. It provides you a cloud storage space, doesn't it? That's what, that's what your subscription's for. Cloud storage, and then that subscription also gets you access to some of the the sort of narratives and story, and uh, you know the background. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah, the War Machine app will offer a subscription option for storing multiple army bills and receiving monthly premium content. So Tom just asked in the chat, do we know if they're keeping Essence? I didn't read anything about Essence and Infernals. Did you? 
that's I, the, I, the, I don't think I picked up anything on Infernals throughout the whole thing. Yeah. No, that no, no mention. If anyone saw anything, just say in the chat. So, yeah, War Room, it's going to be a War Machine app that has War Room within it. There's going to be some kind of subscription service. There's some interesting ideas in there around, like, giving feedback over rules and stuff, which seems pretty cool. I've always, we did a whole episode on this, didn't we, Brett, the other day, about how much we like War Room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've always think PP have kind of led the way with that, so fair play to them to continue in that, like, line of thinking. I've always thought War Room's been pretty, pretty damn good. Monthly uh, subscription uh, at think, four four dollars ninety nine, which is, I mean, that's like half. A I, I think already. getting everything free again, if you're aiming at getting people into the hobby, is is a really sensible move, isn't it? Mm. I, I mean, I, I can't remember what what I paid for the full deck six years ago, but it was it was a fair old it was investment. Like 50, 60 quid or something. I think it was quite expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when hard. when you immediately tell people if you want to play this game, you you need to sort of you know, you really should get this app. <laughs> yeah. And then if you if you want your cards on that app, then you've got to pay this money as well. Yeah. Um it is a it is a big investment. So to yeah. have that for free, you yeah, know, to bring up all your models, good. play games and track damage and stuff like we do currently. Yeah, seems sensible. Yeah. Just uh, so Walsall Warmasters, Lauren mentioned that the limited factions would be largely kept in the game as legacy models for Prime. Infernals, Grimkin, Cop, C G. <laughs> Yeah. They would be yes. largely kept in the game as legacy models for Prime. Okay, fine. So it says, and then he says, so presumably Infernals would be untouched in terms of mechanic, but that's a leap I'm taking. Thank you, mate. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have the uh, the screenshot here. I'm already for it something. Yeah. Um, they're small enough that most models should be Prime. So I think what they mean by that is that they'll they will more there won't be any lost in that gap between what what makes it into an army now in mark four and what just doesn't ends up being unlimited format only they're um, all probably, pretty streamlined yeah. already aren't they they're they're probably already the size that they want the new armies to be mm. yeah 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 definitely next section this is the this is a big section evolve or die <laughs> some of these headlines are pretty intense do you know what i mean it's been watching too many marvel films and shit <laughs> Evolve or die. Christ. The primary differences between the current and the new editions. Headlines are, Mark IV is an evolution of the game. Interesting. We'll find out more tomorrow when the rules are going to drop. So join us live for that at the same time. We'll go through the rules together. Mark IV will support 50, 75 and 100 point battles. Interesting, but we don't really have a great deal. doesn't really mean anything until we know what things cost, right? Yeah, until you see what a, yeah, a warjack so costs, it's... I mean, correct, I, mean, you know I mean, they they do define that as small, medium, and large, don't they? Yeah, brawl, um, brawl. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably like brawl, steamroller, mess about with your mates. I think one of the things they do say on that though is they want to push harder. That it's not seventy-five or nothing, which is realistically, so in the UK, what War Machine is at any kind of a event. I think they want to push much harder the variety of points levels, and have said they'll actually play test models to behave better or be stronger at different point levels as well. And even perhaps restrict some stuff as well. So I think they've maybe taken some of the good things that the Brawl Machine team brought yeah. out and they're trying yeah. to carry that through into Mark IV, which makes total sense to me. I mean, the thing is, is the current the current Steamroller pack does allow you to play tournaments that are different point levels. It's just that no one's interested in doing it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I'll just go for the rest of these bullet points. Mark IV introduces command cards, which provide one-off <laughs> effects like mini feats and can be purchased as part of your force construction. Okay, so those command card things then... You buy and factor into your list. That you is can. What... Yeah, yeah. Oh, what you so, can in so, addition to getting some. So basically, Paul, you don't need to worry about it because you spend all your all your points. I'm on business. I'm stuff. business, baby. I'm on business, baby. I don't mess around. Whereas I'll be spending about half my army points. Yeah, on yeah, just yeah, yeah. Directions. But I'll be like, I've got twenty cards or something, like two models, <laughs> two solos, and like twenty cards. <laughs> I'm afraid of bad news for you, Paul, He's, because it's the standard com com the standard command cards don't have a cost. But there will be some that provide a little more oomph, quote unquote, and as such, will have an army point cost associated. So everybody gets a free hand of them, yeah. and that's that's just below the incredibly well painted non metallic metal or goth stuff. Right. Um, I just want but... business cards. I'm all business. <laughs> Mark IV Warcasters have customizable spell racks. We'll talk about that in a second. I'll find the quote. And Mark IV Warjacks are customizable with multiple weapon and head cortex. 
options. There's quite a lot. I mean, the points thing, yeah, fine. The command cards thing, we have talked about. That's interesting. Depends what those cards actually do before we can really advance much of a chat there other than saying, you know, we like the Arcana mechanics. Quite cool. It adds a nice dynamic to the game. What do you think to these Warcasters have customizable spell racks? What's the vibe I mean, there? Is that like a swap? Spell draft's out? always been one of my favourite formats of the game. <laughs> oh my god, I had flashbacks to us playing spell draft at Smogcon. <laughs> like ridiculous, ridiculous situations. So it, that's a the idea of the rack is again a warcaster carryover. Um, that the deck of cards that you would um, build as a deck building side part from warcaster was called the rack, literally. Um, uh, okay. And. Uh, I think it depends what the spells are, to be honest, and how that's played out. That could be really, really good um, for giving a bit of like modularity, letting you kind of tailor the Warcaster to um, your list a bit more what you enjoy playing. Um, or it could be a bit of a mess of balance and just mean that you know, every caster gets um, Arcane Shield or I doubt we yeah. give TK to, as, a, as a one you can give to anyone, but, you know, things like that. In, in Warcaster, do they have... Do they have set spells that never change and then you've got like an optional two or three that you switch in and out or is it your full spell list that you can switch in and out so you have um you have a generic deck of cards and then you have your faction ones as well you pick a i think it's 14 of them off the top of my head you draw five of them and then you'll you rotate through them as you play through the turns of the game um oh, uh, turn by turn yeah so so as whenever you spend one it goes to the bottom of the pile or it goes to this oh, card and you, oh, the right, okay. you never run out of cards. And that's called the rack. That, is home. that mechanic called the yeah. rack? It, it, I, Warcaster players, there's like four oh. of them in the UK. They're very passionate about it, but um, <laughs> they, they will be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm pretty sure it's called the, the rack. And it's. Um, are, they might just be merging, are, they just, are they just merging Warcaster into War Machine? Because it's not done very well. Just as a just <laughs> just as a, a reflection, because that that if that if they're literally calling it exactly the same mechanic, are they just are they just seen something in Warcaster and thought that's quite cool, let's bring that into War Machine. Bring I mean, the chat says over. chat says yes. Um. <laughs> chat says yes. Uh, We're introducing I... a concept. This is blah, blah, blah. yeah in the fiction a Warcaster's rack is their list of me. <laughs> did did they is it true that they changed? Do you remember when Scar had a big rack? A great yeah, rack. Great not, rack. Not a, a great rack. It's not a card anymore. Did they get rid of that? Yeah, they did. They did. In the fiction, a Warcaster's rack is their list of spells that they have access to during a battle. In Mark IV, Warcasters in the new armies will have some spells fixed, but you will also be able to customise a spell list from a menu of different spells, allowing to allowing you to tailor your Warcaster to your strategy and playstyle. So we don't know what that might look like, Jamie. Maybe it would be some kind of like that now goes to the bottom. I don't know. I imagine you'd need quite a few cards to make that like a playable process. Rather than, um... I, I didn't know whether you'd just have like a little list. It was fantasy, wasn't it? Where you'd pick like the metal spells and then you'd pick from from the range of spells that you wanted for that particular game. So I didn't know whether it'd be something a little bit like that. I, I could see you have flexible utility spells, you know, like a spell that grants Pathfinder. So when you come up against, you know, Circle and you've got to get past them forests and things, like you, you slide that into your deck. Right, okay. Um, you know, Just no, I don't think the flexible ones are going to be ball plus spells. They're going to be more utility spells, aren't they, I think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Dan says, um, I think it's just copying some terminology rather than the full rules. Okay, fine. Yeah, fair, fair point. And then Andy, Andy, I don't know if to read this. Oh, I'm just going to read it. I'm not even bothered. If you bring up Scar's Rack in Crick's Facebook group, it's an Insta battle. It's the pinned post on the page. <laughs> How times have changed. Can you remember some of the stuff we used to say on the old podcast? <laughs> like, Christ. Oh, man. Right, look, now we'll go live to the Facebook. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, what do you think of this Warjack customization? So, you know, taking off our... After, after 20 years, we're embracing true Warjack customization in War Machine. To be honest, a lot of us have been doing it for a while to save money, but nice that they're recognizing it. Do you know what I mean? People have been pinning stuff for a while. The first Warjack kits will be introduced in Mark IV will come with eight different weapon arms, four for each side and four different heads which represent different Cortex abilities. During force construction in War Room, 
you'll be able to customise each of your Warjacks loadouts to best support your strategy and playstyle for your upcoming scenario. But we didn't just reflect this in the rules, we made sure the models support this concept as well. Thoughts? I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for it, personally. I think um, it's I think it's really cool. Um, Warjacks are always... I, mean, I don't know if you see the new Kador Jack that's uh, floating around of that. It's just... It gets back to that sort of steampunk, high-powered high iron machines crunching around the place. And I think it'll, it opens up a lot more. It explains why there's only two Warjacks per theme force, because actually there's only two Warjacks. But when there's eight different weapons, um, bearing in mind you can, uh, and you can combine any you know, four from each side, plus four different heads, which all have their own abilities. Well, do, the math, do the math, Commander. <laughs> How I've, I've run the numbers with my fingers, and it's at least... It's at least more than four ways of building it, which is which is more than the chassis we've got. And so hopefully that brings some of that variety. And what we might find is the model count becomes smaller, um, as in physically the number of models, the number of options. But when you add in, when you layer in the choices of how you load up your war jacks and hopefully war beasts, um, you layer in the command cards, you layer in the spell customization, the models that your individual playing have maybe more replayability value or more versatility and i think as a new player coming into the game that would be really appealing to say you buy this warjack there are you know uh, running the maths it's approximately 80 different ways of playing it um yeah. i'm not very good at maths well <laughs> you've yeah, literally you just it. made it. Yeah. it's, it's going to be somewhere between four and 80 yeah, jamie isn't it i think, I think that's what we've established <laughs> yeah gab said i've got it so actually um uh, Nailed it. numbers <laughs> That's Jamie on the mortars next week. Yeah, it's all right, lads. 25 degrees should be fine. Drop two weeks. <laughs> I've done the numbers. Good enough to go I've done the numbers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's cool. I like the idea of that. I've been, the Legion that I have at the moment is all magnetized. All the Carnivians and Ravagor Sasha is all magnetized and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. So, uh, fair play. Good, good. Seems, seems like a sensible, uh, sensible step. Right. Engineering the future. This has got Gav well happy in the chat. Gav did yeah. call this. Didn't Gav say that he thought it was going to be? Uh, <laughs> can we dial him in as a guest speaker? 3D, yeah. Have it dial him in as a guest speaker. Yeah, yeah. Come he's on, inside. Gav. He'll get caught. He'll go. He's on like, he's seriously like under observation right now by the authorities. Engine <laughs> in the future. Our production of war machine models is changing with the times. Metal is no longer a viable material to produce models with due to rising costs. Overseas plastic product is rising in cost and possesses supply chain risks, as well as difficulties in keeping products stocked. Mat 4 models will be produced using 3D printed technology. Big. Yes. Bump. I, Gav, I'm naked. <laughs> the chat, the chat, <laughs> chat's gone it wrong. Chat, chat's malfunctioned. <laughs> Warjacks are supplied with multiple head and weapon options and are engineered with cavities ready for magnets, which are supplied in the Warjack kits, so loadouts can be easily changed between games. Cool. 3D printing allows us to localise production in overseas markets. Thank you. To address accessibility of the products and eliminate additional costs of shipping and import fees. Okay. And then they've got like an assembly guide picture of a tyrant heavy Warjack, which is the Orgoth vibe, isn't it? Showing yeah. kind of, I've got that up on, so uh, the screen can see it. I mean, this is obvious. This is pretty big. I've this this. Have, are other companies doing this? this? Like like companies that I would have heard of, like you know Malifo. Obviously, GW aren't doing it there. As far working. as I'm tracking, this is the first major international war gaming company to lead their product with 3D printing. There's lots of Kickstarters, lots that have been really upcoming popular. But when you're thinking of the big ones, GW, Corvus Belly, um, Weird Games, um, Fantasy Flight. Steamforge. Um, Steamforge, yeah. Um, none of them have, have, have taken the plunge into 3D printing. And um, this feels like such a um, such a natural way that the, the, the war gaming as a whole is going. And I'm really glad that PP have stuck their heads of the parent and said, we're, we're going to commit to this. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep reading the chat and it's making me laugh. It's not what you said. <laughs> It's a good thing we have, we Gav's not on the chat. If he was saying all this in person, then um, we'd get taken off. So many people are not going to get this because they're not from the UK. But Matt just said maybe, maybe, maybe the Legion Beast could have a Jeremy Beadle wig as a Oh, I don't think that's okay to say. <laughs> it's really tickled me. 
Mm. It already kind of does have like a little. Anyway. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I don't put this on the Cricks group, Andy. Christ. We'll be, we'll be binned and banned. Yeah, you'll be banned from the Legion group when you get off this desk. <laughs> Start appealing for the Jerry B. Oh, it's really tickled me. Yeah, so, they, so someone said, Gav said, PP leading the way. I'm really pleased I've done this. So, yeah, you'd not heard of anyone, Jamie, who's following a similar approach and allowing that kind of like. How, so, how. how Am I right in thinking then that if you do have a 3D printer at home, you would be able to download the sort of kit at a cost and print it yourself? Or is it more they're allowing? No, they're, have... they are going to 3D print the models. Right. That, that was how I read it, I think. So they're yeah. not going to, they're, they're not going to. They're, they're shifting their production from, you know, metal and, and resin and everything right. to 3D printing. Then they're going to put the 3D printed model in a box and still ship that so box. Just made, so is that why the supply is so terrible in the UK? Because it's very difficult for them to to, to create on mass and get it out, whereas exactly. this, they could just they could just slam them out. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. So so it would be. Oh, Gav said they're setting up international printing. Sorry, I did just read that as well. So there will be sort of UK printers that are able to make it. Um, oh, Dana said some companies in other parts of the world will print too. Yeah, fuck, fine. The letter UK they've already... company 3D print models, though, setting up printers in Europe, definitely EU. Thanks, chat. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I mean, that's good for us, right? Is it? Is it good for us? Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, of course it is. If, yeah. if, if the, if the, well, I mean, they make, it seems like the kits would still be of decent quality, right? Would it be? Oh, some of the 3D printed stuff is absolutely outstanding. Yeah. Hmm. Possibly better. It, mold lines becomes a thing of the past. You end up with just the small um, struts yeah. there. The detail only improves, and as the technology increases, they can capitalise on that. It's much easier to take an SDL and you know fine tune it, hone it down. I think than um, trying to transfer across a uh, you know a two part plastic inject res plastic resin injection or a metal mold cast. Yeah. Uh, and it's much cheaper. I don't know if we'll see it or not, but um, uh, there's some prices towards the end. But hopefully from the consumer side, this at the very least caps the price of the hobby. Rather the than, prices? Um, oh, they've, they've talked about the price of um, boxes, mm. haven't they, at some point? I think that's in the next bit, Jamie, am I right? Yeah, I think later on down. But, but again, cutting out the shipping costs, cutting out um, some of the middleman in terms of packaging and... Uh, um, I, I don't know much about it. Uh, I think there were some issues shipping between the US and China um, during COVID and things like that as well. So just yeah. It, yeah. it all it secures a lot more of that. And you know, if 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 let's say they have a company that's printing in Europe, there's a problem with that company for whatever reason, they could license that STL out to other um, printing companies. Maybe somewhere in the UK um, gets a really good setup. They say, cool, we're willing to sell you our STLs, and they send it on. There is the risk of piracy, as is the case with all 3D printing. There already was um, China Cast was a known um, alternative. There's already 3D printing floating around, and I think they they've probably got enough goodwill with the community to buy the products wholesale that they can get away with this without um, feeling they're missing yeah, out. Yeah, because once once the print got out, then you people could print it at home, right? Yeah. W once yeah. the the thing got out. But I, I think I think people have turned to China China Cast, and then we always used to joke, didn't we, about Black Anchor EU as well. Yeah, basically, yeah. you know, Dan Jones running, Dan Jones running Eldar, uh, Wraith, whatever they are. Don't be saying people's done. full names doing illegal activity, Brett. That's not illegal. No, he wasn't doing anything illegal. He was just playing GW models in PP events. That's it's not illegal. Oh, right, okay. Thought you were That's on that people upon. dodgy prints. Um, but the only reason people were doing that was because we can't get the models. Mm. And that's that's what drove them to to pursue those alternative yeah. sourcing of models, isn't it? And this yeah, is just it, such a huge barrier right now, isn't it? Like people getting into the game. Yeah, yeah. If I can jump online, order a model, and and it, you know, and I get it three days later, great. I don't, yeah. I don't need to worry about you know sourcing alternatives, yeah. legal or alternative <laughs> or otherwise. I, yeah. I think, I think the comparisons to look at is you could go to Tesco's now and you could buy everything you need to make yourself a full curry dinner, or you could pick up the phone, and you could order <laughs> from an. Going with it. Or you can pick up a phone, you can call a takeaway, and they'll bring it to you already. Genuinely, in the 40s and 50s, when supermarkets came out and international food came in, there was a concern that restaurants would all go under, because why would you go and pay for food that you could just go and buy and cook yourself at the restaurant? But actually, people are lazy. And people like it when people go and make it themselves. And I, I hope that 3D printing will end up being the same thing. 3D printing 
individually is quite time consuming, quite long winded. And to just say, you know what, I'm going to pay someone a bit extra, just send me the model. Um, I think that'll really pay dividends. Yeah. Nice little analogy there, Jamie. I didn't I say you were, never, you were so passionate about making the nation fat? Well, <laughs> yeah. The passionate no, cookery whatever, eater. Whatever floats your boat, do you know what I mean? Tomorrow's okay. podcast, we're just going to do a cookery show. We're not actually going to talk about war machines. <laughs> That's <laughs> cracking me up tonight. Proof that Jamie is a time travelling spy. Talking about the 40s and the 50s like it was yesterday. <laughs> All yeah, sorts yeah. is coming to light. I'm not going to make the Captain Rogers joke. <laughs> Who's Captain Rogers? Oh my word, Steve Captain Rogers, America. Captain America. Is he, is he one of those superheroes in that game that you don't like? Oh, the idiot with the shield. Nah, no, I don't like Captain America. Yeah, not into him. He not seem, for you. He's, yeah. he's never seemed super enough. Do you know what I mean? You've got a shield and you're hard. Yeah. <laughs> what could, you can't do enough, right? Uh, so I think we've covered the 3D printing. Seems good. SKUs. <clears throat> What's that stand for, please, guys? SKUs. No? It's it's just the retail All right. thing, isn't it? Someone will know in the chat. Someone will know for sure. Yeah, someone will the know. Rollout the rollout strategy. The rollout strategy for Mark 4. Each I'll, mark... go I'll Google it while we're, while we're chatting. Each Mark Good, Good Night Sweetheart Series 2. Oh, no, that's something else. You was... <laughs> I'm getting mixed up. That's not what SKU does. It's it? stock it's, keeping units. Of course it is. Stock it's a number that retailers use to differentiate products and stock track inventory levels. There we go. Of course that, we knew that. Of course knew we knew that. that. I knew that. Each Mark IV Ami will possess a limited number of SKUs, making the line easier to stock for retailers and distributors. Hmm. Core Ami starters will contain enough models to field a 50-point Ami with options. Add an expansion box to a starter provides enough models to field a 75-point army with options. Add a warjack to have enough models to field a 100-point army with options. So warjacks are what, like 25 points then? Yeah? I mean, that probably gives... I, I guess that, we'll see some points values tomorrow, but it starts to give you a feel, doesn't it, for for the points orientation of the game? Because they're saying, what, a, a warcaster? Is it three warjacks? Two uh, couple of units. Yeah, I'll break it down. For There's you two now. come in the starter box, isn't there? So two in the starter box and one additional. The core army starter is at the starter box, yeah? I'll tell you what that's yeah, got in yeah. now. It's got one warcaster, one jack, one warjack, another right. warjack, one assault reavers unit, six models, one strike reavers unit, six models, and so, yeah. one core so... barrage of three models, a coven three models, and a solo. Yeah, so I mean that doesn't sound overly dissimilar to what we're seeing on the board at the moment. So they basically described an army that's three heavies, two units, yes. and then some support units or small units and a couple of solos. That, that sounds that, like that's that sort of what we're playing now. Uh, what two jacks, two units? No, because they've added another jack, haven't they, to make it up to a hundred points? Yeah, yeah, I was just no, that's fifty points there, right? Yeah, no, so that's yeah. fifty. And then yeah, the arm, go on, go on, Jamie. I was going to say, it, do, it does say with options as well, so this is possibly slightly over. Um, yeah. Particularly when we don't know what the implications of swapping around the Jack's arms and their cortexes and things like that are going to mean. But, but yeah, um, it, it, I agree. I think it feels about the same as a point size game here. Um, maybe 100 points will be the new 75. We all remember when 75 was the new 50. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Andy says that's 21 models for a 50 point list. And that'll come in at $199. So what's that at the moment, exchange rate-wise? Like 160 quid or something? Yeah, 160, 170. Uh, 199. Uh, yeah, 100, 165 quid. Probably not a million miles away from what that would cost you to get a Warcaster, two Warjacks, two units, like two mini units and a solo. Maybe a bit punchier. Well, I mean, obviously... First hand from a shop rather than yeah yeah, for, yeah. Then the I army. Think, I think there's, a, there's a saving to be made there. I think like a warjack kit's costing thirty thirty five quid now. Yeah. 
the think the thinking here is obviously that what we talked about before with like the model bloat. There was a time when carrying the full range of War Machine Hordes models could take up twenty feet or more of grid wall space. I mean, yeah, fair enough. And their approach is to release a very limited number of product SKUs for each army, so distributors and retailers who wish to keep the products in stock do not have to devote yards of shelf space to them, and players do not have to sift through an endless catalogue of codes looking for models. Seems like a sensible business decision. Obviously, we're at the selfish part of us is want is focusing more about like, well, how does it affect the game rather than how does it affect the business? But like we've recognised at the beginning, if your business isn't functioning and making money, it's pretty hard for a game to function around it full stop. So. Yeah, and I think that's, we spoke about that a little bit off air, didn't we? That obviously PP are a business. They, they've they got to come up with ideas that make us, <laughs> the yeah. players, the consumers, spend money. Um, and, and so that'll be driving some of their decisions while also trying to maintain a, a game that's in a really good, healthy state in terms yeah. of rules, interactions and everything else. Um, so I made the observation, I don't mind doing it again, that in a lot of ways, I'm probably a bad customer for PP because I've been in the hobby for a long time now. So, you know, I don't, I don't currently spend a lot of money buying new models because I've got them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, they, they need to somehow persuade me to buy some new models again. And I think we didn't talk about this earlier, but it, it struck me while we were, we've, we've been chatting. I think when we started playing in Mark II, it wasn't unusual to own multiple factions, but that was because it, it was small enough to own multiple factions. But as it's as it's got bigger, that capacity to, to own two or three small yeah. factions has disappeared. So, you know, in a, in a lot yeah. of ways, the, the game, as it's evolved and grown, has also driven us to just be one faction players. So I, again, from a from a money making model, that means immediately I I'm only now ever buying new releases for my one faction. You know, whereas previously I might make quite a big investment because I just buy into a, a new faction because for a few hundred quid I could get all the models I wanted and put them on the table and yeah. and, and play. Yeah, fair so, observation. Yeah, yeah, I, you know that. There's there's business acumen driving those yeah. decisions. Yeah. yeah, that's that's fair play. Just, just to run through the kind of costings quickly, so the army expansion, would be an estimated cost of one hundred and seventy five dollars. So like one hundred and forty or something. I don't know. Jamie, do the numbers. The army yeah. the army expansion five. provides enough additional. How much? One four five mate. One four five. One four five. Additional models to fill a seventy five point army with options. As an example, the Storm Legion expansion. So is this something you'd add to the core army starter? Yeah. Or, yeah? So this yes, would, okay. Yeah. So Warcaster, a unit, six models, a three model unit, a three model unit, a solo, another solo. So yeah, maybe it's a little bit bigger than what you'd expect on the table at the moment for 75, maybe. Although it does say with options, so yeah, who knows? Maybe maybe not a million miles away. Warcaster C estimated cost of fifteen to twenty five dollars, depends on the model. Warjack A, so Warjack would be around thirty five to forty five dollars, depends on the model. Another Warjack options thirty five to forty five. So again, not a million miles away from what we kind of pay anyway. Yeah, yeah. Thirty yeah. quid for a, a model, an eighty mil base solo around. 55 to 65 dollars how big is 80 mil again what's what's an eight what's on an 80 mil battle engine no, nothing, nothing. Yet. it's a new so it's, it's between a, new a heavy size. war jack and a colossal well isn't that a battle no battle engine no it's a new colossal. it's a new base size cool first released in warcaster oh is that a warcaster <laughs> thing okay there is a, yeah. there is a thing yeah. the first year of map 4 releases will also include six mercenary solos that will work with two different factions what this means for distributors and retailers is that the line will be much more manageable in or to order and restock if they wish to carry the full catalogue. The first year will only include a total of 30 individual product SKUs. But even if retailers don't wish to stock the full line perpetually, by only carrying the core army starters, they'll be able to offer new players a ready-to-play army right off the bat, right off the shelf of a single purchase. Thoughts on that? Seems sensible. None of that. That's just like a business decision that makes sense considering their current situation, right? We've kind of broke that down. Yeah, yeah. I, again, my I, I guess my only observation would be 
the way it's described there is that the war caster seems to be linked with with a large purchase of ancillary models and so if i want to get Warcaster b it seems at the moment i've got to buy that top up set for 145 pounds 175 the, the yeah, or some set. five dollars or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. So again, yeah, if you yeah, if you wanted Madison Calder, you'd have to buy the army expansion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. I think this is this is probably the only part on the few parts of the announcement I'm disappointed with. Um, there's no again the eternal battle, you know, GW. They start collecting sets of their battle box. I think it's still about 60 to 70 quid, yeah, something yeah. like that. So you're looking at well over double um, the the opening gambit to someone to try the game. Now, maybe the expansion box has actually become the way to get there a bit cheaper. Well, let, let me just jump in on the chat, though, because I don't know if change what you're going to say. Oh. But people are saying they're going to release models um, a la carte directly through PP. Okay. So, Brett, if you, so if you, wanted, oh, okay. that, if you okay. wanted that second caster, Brett, you'd be able to do the traditional... Just do buy it on the moment. Order from PP. I guess the only downside is it's going to take a couple of weeks to turn up. Yeah. Whereas unless they print like, it in the UK. Then someone said, "Unless they print it, to start collecting anymore." Does it not? So maybe that's not too terrible. Maybe does that alleviate your worry there, Jamie, that you'll be able to get your bits? A, a little bit. I just, I, 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 my gut instinct felt like if there was a, like it's a hard sell on a club night. You know, you've got your got your guy girl who comes up and says, oh, "I'm interested in this," and say, "Cool, throw 150 quid at this box." A game and i'd have liked it if there was just something like there were problems with the battle boxes don't get me wrong um but at least it, if someone wants to try it it didn't feel like they were investing a big yeah, chunk yeah. of money um uh, i mean the but, I, I mean the gw starter, box, yeah. starter kits though jamie are, are obscene aren't they for the value yeah yeah so glitchy bits just said they're 160 us dollars oh really okay it's, i mean that's, country, that's, country. that's that's pretty uh, country yeah and uh Fair on, your, that, on your spy wage, Jamie, I'd be thought you'd this would be sort of water off a duck's back. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You'd be buying all sorts. So yeah. I know. I've, I've just so I've, I've just pulled up. I've just put the dreaded GW um, on the tab here. Start collecting Iron Jaws, sixty-five quid. Start collecting Slaves to Darkness, sixty-five. Um, Car Caradron, sixty-five. Um, uh, uh, I might, maybe I'm just seeing a different bit, but the start collecting. No, you, you, you make a you make a website. good point as as well because like GW, I guess. You can't. I mean, their range is so huge and so accessible that people could just go buy in and buy a single unit to just sort of get into. You know what I mean? They can. You can yeah. really ease yourself into the game. But I think PP are in a in a challenging position where they want to make this like a streamlined, easy way of printing and distributing models, but they want to make it profitable enough to make it worthwhile. So they're probably thinking mm -hmm. this is like a bit of a medium for them that like it's hopefully not too expensive to completely put people off, but. I mean, I, I think the, the GW sort of two-player starter sets that they do, I mean, they just sell them at a loss. They must do. Yeah. You know, and, to because, you know, I know so many people that just, you know, they go in with friends, don't they, to double up on, on one half of the starter box. Mm -hmm. But the, the value is so good. Yeah. That, you know, they'll, they'll pick up three starter boxes and then they've, they've got all the core units and heroes and everything else that they need to, to yeah. crack on straight away and play games. Glitchovich yeah. is saying in the chat, start collecting boxes are discontinued, combat patrols replacing them, and they're double the cost in the US, hundred and sixty dollars. So it's not a, it's not a Fair million enough. it's not a million miles away. I still think there's validity in what you're saying, Jamie. The, la the last uh, oh there's two more bits, but just to sort of we're getting near the end now. Transitioning from Mark three to Mark Four and organized play, just outlined some of their plans. Committed to supporting Mark Three events through the end of twenty twenty two. Well, that's good because that's all they'll be, I guess, till 2023. Other people will be beta tested and playing Mark IV, I imagine. Official Mark IV events and organized play will begin in 2023. Privateer will focus on key signatory events at conventions we attend while supporting third party competitive events like the WTC and Warfare Weekend, which is taking up the Iron Gauntlet. In store and club organized play kits will be available 20, early 2023. That's great to read, isn't it? That's that's. <clears throat> that's fine. Yeah, it's good. Interesting that they're going to be at WTC. I think they're streaming. There's something that says them about streaming at WTC. Yeah, this year we'll even be attending a WTC to stream the event. That is brilliant. That's really mm, great news. 
and at the store and club level we expect to have organized play kits available in early 2023 and we will be leveraging the tools we're building into the war machine app to enhance these experiences that's great because we've been crying out for more like stuff since the abandonment of the press gang thing we've been yeah, crying yeah. out for that kind of stuff haven't we so fair play to um putting putting that out there there was dave so they're scrapping iron gauntlet is going to warfare weekend yeah so that won't be our events at gen con will be mark three events and with the generous hosting of warfare weekend we'll be wrapping up the iron gauntlet that has been on pause since the pandemic locked everyone down. We also did not want to throw any sort of curveball into the upcoming WTC that we know teams prepare for all year. As far as organised play, play events go, they'll be mark free until we close the books until 2022. We're aiming to release the 2023 steamroller document at the end of November. This we will be revising for Mark 4 and beginning in 2023. We'll transition our own events to Mark 4 with Adepticon being the first of our planned public events. Although they still plan to host competitive events at conventions, they will be stepping back from running a yearly competitive circuit and will be passing the Iron Gauntlet to Warfare Weekend. Organisations like the WTC and Warfare Weekend are able to specialise and put more constant attention on the highly competitive events than we're able to do with the broad range of different things we're managing. Instead, we'll be putting our support behind these competitive events in the form of promotion and coverage, and this year we'll even be attending the WTC to stream the event. But this will also free us up to focus on key signature events at the content conventions we attend throughout the year. These events will be heavy on the narrative, highlighting in-setting historical or world-changing events, as well as experimental formats that will re still reward skill and strategy, but where participating in the unique experience is the prize unto it is a prize unto itself. What do you think to that, gents? It's kind of like a distance in a little bit from the crunchy competitive end and recognizing that they want to do a bit more of the fluff and some suggestion there that they're kind of passing the mantle over to groups like WTC and Warfare Weekend. But I, I think if they're still going to have a presence of those things, if they're, if they're going to become the streaming avenue for those activities, then from a, from a marketing and PR perspective, again, I think that's probably a good move. You know, we, you know, I, I know the States is a little bit different, but we, in the UK, we get no support from, from PP, you know, we're, we're already running all our events independently. So, you know, from our perspective, it's going to make very little difference whatsoever. Um, but it will certainly be good to get PP over at the WTC and get a bit of a presence there and get them to just recognize, acknowledge and promote it through their social media streams and everything else. You know, yeah. that'll be, that'll be really good for the WTC, but that as a celebration of the game, they'll probably get more out of doing that than they would from running events themselves. Yeah. You agree, Jamie? Gav's agreeing. Gav's saying, oh, I like the distance from comp and focus on narrative exactly makes no difference to the rest of the world. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think it's fantastic that they, they've been doing it more of the last couple of years, but really post-COVID, recognising the big events. The Welsh Masters got a shout-out and the WTC's got plenty of coverage. I think... Um, I've been RhineCon um, or the Polish Masters, um, and it's nice from the, as the European side to, to be getting that recognition there as well. And uh, yeah, makes sense. Get it passed out over to the people ordering the events and just support them by turning up and rewarding that hard work and they'll carry it through the passion of the communities there. And it probably frees them as well creatively a bit. They don't have to yeah. think about, you know, running, you know, the, the yeah. War Machine series where everything has to be spot on. This is going to be, you know, they're, they're, there's also a step of accountability away from it as well. And it means that probably the staff and the individuals, they don't have to be quite as as competitive tournament focused and can can th be more leading in the the narrative events the look you know the um the creative the wacky stuff which is really where their expertise lies i think in taking their huge knowledge and ideas about the game and doing new interesting stuff with it yeah papa car dan says as long as they keep the rules competitive then they can run their events in the us the eu isn't running their events the the EU is running their events always alone. Sorry, Mr. Red, that Gavin yeah, yeah. had agreed the rules need to remain yeah. tight and intuitive. Last bit then, what's next? What to do with this massive flood of information? Tomorrow, download the better rule document, two legacy demo armies and the rules for both Orgoth Sea Raiders and the Signar Storm Legion battle groups and take Mark 4 for a test drive. If you find typos, errors, bugs in the docs, let us know at feedback at private 
Therapypress.com. New Mark IV armies begin shipping this fall. War Machine app better release end of October. And cool. sell all your models because the game is, is sell collapsing. all your models. Doom, it's over. No, it's <laughs> uh, I can't wait to read the rule document tomorrow. I think that's the bit that will really, that's way super. This is all good, but it's, that's so important for me to see what that rule set actually looks like. Speaking to you, Jamie, has made me realise there are some similarities in the Warcaster vibe, so it, it will be really interesting to see what they've picked up there and not picked up there. Base sizes, the whole rack thing, interesting. The bit that I, I can't remember where it was in the document, but the bit, the one bit that made me like, ah, was a bit where they'd said about like, ran, let's see if I can find it, like random. <laughs> random um, terrain. Just like random things happening. Like, yeah, yeah. I, th I think the preceding sentence was to make things simpler, and then it and then it introduced a random element to the game. I was like, yeah. well, those two things don't go hand in hand. Oh, I can't find it. The, the the bits I hate really, really, really random things. You know, like we were talking about it before, weren't we, Jamie? Like random charge distance and things like that. It's like, oh, we we don't like the game being solved, so we want to make things like super random. Like, well, the thing that was great about War Machine and Hordes is the fact that you can have a level of certainty around doing particular things. And yeah, there's always randomness, you know, but the best strategies are built around the law of averages and it's a math based problem that you solve. And, mm -hmm. and a, it's a numbers based problem. It's a puzzle. It's a number, but basically one machine is a number puzzle. If you view, if you understand the everything that's going on, it's an, it's a number puzzle. And, if you add randomness because you think people have solved something, you're basically breaking the puzzle so that you can only solve the puzzle so much and the rest is just luck. And yeah. that oh, that is all, oh, that's just, that's... I mean, again, it, let's, that's why I'm excited about seeing the rules. That's why I'm excited about yeah. seeing the rules because that might just be, you know, maybe that's like the cards. I, I don't know. Or the, maybe it's a maybe it's a terrain thing, but if it, if it's a fundamental crucial part of the game, um, do you remember though we used to have random terrain? Do you remember we used to have like was it burning forests and the forests used to go out and things? Yeah. But they used yeah. to, but flags used to disappear. Remember? But all that used to happen was people used to forget to roll for the forest to go out, and then they just end up playing them as normal forests. Yeah. <laughs> like, like they just bypass those and like you say jamie flags used to disappear but you get to turn four and then you'd realize as someone walked past and said oh that flag's supposed to have gone and you're like all oh, right yeah <laughs> Gav um, said Gav said in chat what a load of tosh pp saying the game could be solved makes me and then he's still an angry <laughs> face i'm not sure the game could be as, as, is the game solved the game feels like um it can't feel that so it doesn't feel very solved right now it it, it it's never really felt solved it, it's felt less balanced whether you could call that it being solved i don't know it's no no you can't you can't solve it because from a from an ecological perspective the terrain's different on every table your opponent's different every time you play the game uh you go first or you go second like it, it only takes them to miss a clutch attack or for you to hit a clutch attack and it just changes the whole dynamic of the game like the the player environment interaction is such that there's always going to be a random component to that yeah for sure uh, it, you know we're not playing a closed loop game that's only got you know one or two potential outcomes to every interaction that we're doing yeah. you know mm -hmm. every little interaction that we do impacts the next action within the game and yeah. once you get something as complex and multifaceted as that you can't solve it dan dan just said i do think things settle and things settle is a bit like solved i get that i get that i get that yeah yeah so, but yeah, settled and settled solved and are two yeah, very different, are different things yeah yeah they do mean they're different, very different things yeah Ian said metas exist because the game can't be solved and gavin says saying you have solved the game just shows how little you understand it Gav's full of energy tonight. He's sat in his hot tub, isn't he? He's, he's, full of, he's full of passion. Right, so watch for more information coming this week. Wednesday, a thorough review of the differences between, between Mark 3 and Mark 4 rules. 
the reasons behind the changes plus the better rules beta better rules document two legacy demo armies cricks and protectorate and mark four rules for Orgoth sea raiders and signal storm Legion battle groups previewing at gen con next week tomorrow is absolutely massive that that for me is like the crunch the i mean and it's just a better so like feedback obviously can change things but that will absolutely fundamentally show the direction they want to take the game in in terms of yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what mark four looks like that will be mega and we're going to do a show out with tomorrow gents at the same time i think yeah yeah, yeah. occasion we'll do two in a week yeah so jump on jump on tomorrow guys for the same chat and debrief on the rules because that's going to be that's super super important thursday hobbying with the new 3d printed models and how to magnetize your warjacks gav can be excited about that friday a brief description of dusk house Kalis. Kalis? Kalu? Kalu? how would you say that Kalis. is that retribute retitibut on vampire elves <clears throat> quick retribution crossover it was uh, already called in one of the local oh, groups right, okay fine and then there's a final picture of the timeline again which we kind of showed um kind of showed earlier i kind of stretch it about i'm not gonna go for it all because everyone can kind of see it but the the full release being january 2023 baby general reflections and conclusions gents after we've been through all that positive ambivalent negative i think it's a combination of just excitement and anxiety like you know like and and both are very natural emotions to, it's like to the game <laughs> it's, yeah 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 exactly you know it's we're excited life. because we're getting all those things that we wanted it seems like they've been listening to things you know, a, a, a good shake-up's always typically good for the game. But then equally, you know, you, you, you're playing around with something that we're passionate about and that we love, and so naturally there's going to be a degree of anxiety around that. But, you know, over the coming weeks, we hope uh, the excitement starts to outweigh the anxiety as we get to know more and more about what's going on. I'll tell you what I will say. I'll come to you, Jerry, but it's like a general reflection. Fair play for explaining it in such detail. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hats off to to Matt and the PP staff, who've clearly gone really far in terms of like let's really people might not agree with everything that they've said, but fair play for explaining it in detail, validifying and explaining the choices. I think that's good. That's what we talked about. We did the cast is PP's like a focus causing fury. This is the sort of thing we wanted. Like just tell us what's going on. Just be open and transparent and give yeah, us they've, information. They've rationalized their decisions, haven't they? They've explained them and and whether we agree or disagree, at least now we understand why they're doing it. Yeah. Jamie, what do you think? Um yeah, I fully agree with that. It's it's um huge credence to them as a company to be this open. Um, not many, not many businesses would, you know, put their be this open about their decisions and the reason, and take us through. You know, they, they talk about, you know, we considered merging, uh, you know, giving the old models and giving the same ones, so like bastions and incinerators from mouth. Oh, what do they call that? They call it squishing or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, said, you know, they said we looked at this. You know, we thought about this. We thought about, um, you know, uh, moving to uh, to to not cyocast, but you know, to alternative means of that. So they 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 do tell us the methodology behind it, which I really credit. Um, this is a huge swing for them, and uh, I really, really hope that it pays off because they have clearly gone outside their comfort zones. Um, they they pushed um, a lot of creativity and a lot of energy into this, and um, I really hope it pays off for them as a company um, and indeed uh, for Russell's community for this to be a success. I think what we need now as a community is to get behind this in a way and not not turn a blind eye to problems and not don't be honest and not saying you can't have bad thoughts or negative feedback, but, um, but to not fill the, the, all the Facebook pages with are oh, my army's useless and I can't play ever again um, to give them time, let them, let them explain the full picture of what they're coming up with and give it a go. Even if it's just a couple of games with the legacy models they release, give Mark four a try. And if it's not for you, fair enough, keep playing Mark three sell off your stuff i'm sure there'll be lots of new players who want to get involved with a cheap legacy army um give this a go uh and um you know find a war game that does make you you know does help you enjoy the hobby but i i think there's really something interesting here and i'm excited to see what it yeah. really brings yeah, definitely. You, you, can, you can absolutely guarantee that they'll have sat around their corporate table in the headquarters going how do we simultaneously 
excite new people into the hobby without getting all the established players to sell all the stuff and leave. Mm -hmm. You know, because that doesn't grow the hobby, does it? That just keeps it neutral. Yeah. You know, they need the, <laughs> the players they've got currently to stay and then they need to add new players to that. And so, mm -hmm. so they would be very foolish to disregard established players. And I, I'm sure that they have considered that in a lot of detail as yeah. to how we keep them on board, keep them happy, keep them engaged, and maybe persuade them to buy, you know, some Storm Legion models. I think we'll find out tomorrow what there are loads about that intention as well. Because, like, the thing we, we, as a group at Flail, love about the rule set is how tight and competitive it is and just, just the, the mechanics that it has. And I think our fear that we were talking about in the chat, particularly in the York chat with the York guys, was... Oh God, the game actually feels really great. Like, you know, we really like it. It feels, you know, we really enjoy. It. I hope it doesn't, you know, I hope it doesn't kind of reset too much of that. So, seeing those rules, I think for me, will, will be a big indication of what that process has resulted in. You know, is that rule set? Does it provide the same level of strategy and depth, and doesn't take it too far down a, a randomness angle? And are those models that they're putting forward as like, look, okay, here's what some armies look like. Do they still have the same level of synergy and depth and you know in interesting variations that we like from the existing model range? That for me will be like a fundamental um, part of it. So I, look I guess the the core rules are super solid, aren't they? And yeah, yeah. Mark two to Mark three, the core rules I think they they were tidied up, but there weren't any. Well, super was the measuring the changes. huge thing was the measuring. So, the so there was basically was like the pre measure, yeah. pre measure, and then they took out the command checks and stuff, didn't they? For oh, losing they half the unit, they were all that was a yeah, yeah, but, you know, I, they were sort of the really big things. But I think once everyone got past the notion of pre measuring, yeah. they became quite comfortable with it. And you, you certainly don't hear anyone complaining that their units don't run away anymore when you lose half oh, your men. It was awful. It was an awful. You know, or you get charged by one bane thrall that caused fear, and then your whole unit's just useless awful. because it fails its command check. Yeah. Unless so, you happen to you fill in these gun mages, in which case, get off the table. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only way you, the that's the only way you could beat him was just getting them to run away on a command check. Yeah, yeah, yeah fair. I know we're not supposed to speculate, but there are some interesting hints along the way here. They've talked about differences to movement, differences to blast. They talk about modernizing it, which is something I think is interesting, but we could probably have a look at that tomorrow. I think there's yeah. some more Warcaster stuff that they've trialed and liked and they're going to bring into War Machine, but if uh, I don't want to spoil it for, for everyone here. Yeah, let's 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 get let's get into that tomorrow, and your Warcaster knowledge will be interesting, Jamie, when we look into the... Are, are you 25% of the Warcaster playing community, Jamie? Pro probably to be fair and I, and I should really get involved it's probably someone's turn to go and <laughs> he's 50 on he's got multiple personalities <laughs> he plays his Russian self all the time goes up a side at the table and does his act <laughs> sorry Jamie hey, it's a good game it's a good, it's a good game and you're a good lad right thanks to everyone uh, thanks to everyone in the chat who jumped in and took part I'm sorry we couldn't go everything that was said there was to be honest there was a lot of, there was a lot to take in but I'm glad I managed to read out some of the most offensive and irrelevant comments um, <laughs> on the way. I'm off on the Crick's Facebook forum now just to see. <laughs> it's on Insta band. Wicked. All right. Gav said, thanks for standing in for me, Jamie. If you ever get out, Gav, it might be a permanent thing. Do you know what I mean? You might have to be doing this from the inside. If you can get a phone in there, then maybe you can still play a part in always in the chat. <laughs> We'll do our best. All right, boys. Good to see you both. Thanks, everybody mm. in the chat. Really appreciate it. Obviously, please follow, like, subscribe, all that jazz. It really helps. It really helps get more people learning and, and thinking about the game. And feedback on anything we chatted about, the content we're doing is super useful. So until tomorrow night, take care. We'll speak soon. See you later, mm. gents. Cheers, guys.